Well, howdy, worship gathering. How many of you are ready to hear some good preaching from the Word of God tonight? Give me a good amen out there. I'm inviting you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 1. And tonight we're going to kind of dovetail uh, a lot of what we heard last Sunday from Pastor Dauda Traore, who was amazing, wasn't he? Gosh, we got to have him back soon. But tonight I want to talk to you about, from the book of Colossians, how Jesus is supreme in authority. Say that with me, supreme in authority. Now, one of the trends that has become more prominent kind of in the modern church, especially over the last 20 or 25 years, is what was once known as the emerging or emergent church, but it's kind of morphed into something um, more now, and that is something called progressive Christianity. It's kind of a redefinition of what it means to be a Christian. Now, in its most extreme forms, um, it is people who seek to emulate the character of Jesus without stressing the exclusivity, the authority, and the lordship of Jesus. Everybody say that with me, the lordship of Jesus. So it's not that these people are overtly denying Christ and many precincts of our, of our culture are people who want to embrace what they perceive to be the character of Jesus, but they don't necessarily want to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. They want to accept him on certain levels, but at the same time diminish his authority. Now, we're studying in the book of Colossians and the city of Colossae is a city in which this scenario is precisely what was taking place in the church in Colossae. Now, this was a city that was marked by a blend. Remember, we talked about the syncretism milkshake of paganism, Judaism, and philosophy. And the church in Colossae had been infiltrated by this thinking. And some of the believers were attempting to make their own Christianity, combining all these elements of paganism and secular philosophy with Christian doctrine. And again, this is known as syncretism. Now, the resulting heresy later became known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism emphasized special knowledge while denying Christ as God and Savior. You might think of it in today's culture, kind of an, an analogous comparison would be, hey, let's trust the science. We don't need to trust Jesus. So just like progressive Christianity, it's not that they were denying Christ. They were just wanting to diminish him, reduce him as one of the ways to know God. Just one of the many voices, quote, in the conversation. And in some ways, this is worse than outright denying Christ, as it is much more subtle and it is much more deceptive. But believe me, my brothers and sisters, it is every bit as destructive. So the Apostle Paul, once he got word of what was going on, in this church, he, from his Roman prison cell, wrote this letter to bring correction to the error in doctrine. And its purpose is to take Jesus away from the table of conversation and instead to his rightful place on the throne of lordship. Say it again with me, on the throne of what? Lordship. It is the place of his preeminence. It is the place of supremacy. That's the title of our sermon series. Am I right? And that is the purpose of this sermon series. It is the purpose of our worship service tonight. It is the purpose of even having a church 
at all, and that is to exalt Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Come on, give me a good amen out there. So we don't want to diminish him. We want to magnify him. Now, in week one of our series, we read about the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Colossian believers and how this is the leadership, our prayer for every one of you in our congregation, that you be filled with wisdom and understanding, that you live a life worthy of the Lord, that your life bears fruit, and that you are filled with the power of God. And the passage ended with the resounding description of how God has saved us. And so that's verses 13 and 14. Then we have verses 15 and 16, which is our memory verse. And then we have verse 17, which was our bonus verse. And I'm gonna see if I can do it all from memory. Um, So here it is. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his son who he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. For whether Thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Come on, give it up for your pastor. I got it all memorized. Give me a woohoo. All right. So who is the son of God? Well, it's Jesus Christ. And the passage that follows could be considered the theme passage of the book. That is our memory verse, right? 15, 16, and 17. Now, most people agree that the world would be a much better place, and we're just all gonna take a poll on this. How many of you believe that the world would be a much better place if more people would follow the teachings of Jesus? Am I right or am I right? And that is absolutely 100% true. But that, family, is a far cry from seeing Jesus the way the Bible portrays Jesus. He's more than just a teacher. He's more than just a philosophy. We can't just reduce him to a Mediterranean peasant who went about doing good, uh, spouting pithy sayings. He's more than a religious prophet. He was more than a good man. He's more than simply a good teacher. He's more than even a the leader of a worldwide religion. In this passage, we see Jesus as much more than a great addition to our lives. That's kind of uh, Western Christianity is is like we have our lives, we have all the things that we wanna do, and we just wanna add Jesus to our lives, and then we just kind of keep going about. No, 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 no. We don't wanna just add Jesus to our lives. We wanna give him our whole life and make him our all in all. He's not our supplement. He is our sustenance. He is preeminent Lord of all or supreme. Now, to help us understand this concept, I want us to fast forward a little bit in the book to a key verse. This is another verse that, you know, the Lord gives you the grace to do so you should memorize. And we'll cover this in our teaching later, but for tonight, to underscore this idea of lordship and this under, underscore this idea of preeminence, to underscore this idea of supremacy, I want you to go to Colossians chapter two, and let's look at verse number six together. Colossians chapter two and verse six. And I would like all of us to read it together. Are you ready? Here we go. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Now, we don't have time to teach on this right now, but you see, getting saved is not the end, it's the beginning. So we receive Christ Jesus as Lord at salvation, and then we do what? Continue to live in him. But for tonight, I want you to zero in on that word, just as you receive Christ Jesus as what? Lord. Okay. 
Here is the Greek word for the word Lord in the New Testament, and it is this, kuros, and this is what this word means, supreme in authority. How many of you like getting nachos supreme? I like me some nacho supreme sometimes. That may be the only thing I'll ever eat from Taco Bell because I really don't like Taco Bell all that much. But nacho supreme, really all nacho supreme means is you put a dollop of sour cream on it. Um, But we're not gonna put a dollop of sour cream on Jesus and call him supreme. That's not what makes him supreme. What makes him supreme is his character. It's who he is, that he is supreme in authority. And that's what the essence of the book of Colossians is all about. And it's about what the passage that we are examining tonight is all about. So again, we're going to kind of dovetail and just reiterate a little bit of what we heard last week from Pastor Dowda. So let's go and turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read between verses 15 through verse number 22. So go there with me, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15, and uh, we're going to go down to uh, verse 22. Now I'm reading out of uh, 2011 NIV, so it may be worded just a little differently from what we've kind of been memorizing, but the essence of the text is the same. So here we go. This is verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the what, church? Supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he is reconciled to you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. We pray that over the next few minutes that you by your Holy Spirit, will open our hearts, that your word will be planted deep into the soil of our hearts, that it will produce fruit, and that it will change us from the inside out. And I pray that when we leave this place tonight, that not one of us will be the same as how we came in, that we will be changed to be more like you. Let your word find its place, God, and produce fruit. We pray it in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Okay. So 15 times in this passage, we find the words him, his, he, and himself. So the whole passage is clearly about Jesus. It's clearly about him. And so what we find when we examine the text is that we learn that Jesus Christ is Lord, kuros, or supreme in authority, over a couple of things. The first thing, number one, write this down, it's in your notes. He is supreme in authority over creation. Come on, say that with me. Over what? Creation. So here the Bible teaches that not only did God create the heavens and the earth, but that Jesus is that very God. Look at the text. It it says Christ is, letter A, the image of the invisible God. He's more than a symbol. He's more than an icon, but the very manifestation of God himself. Years ago, we heard a guest speaker. It was Dr. Jack Hayford's brother, and he taught us that when God speaks, 
He always sounds like his word. Can I get an amen there? When God speaks, he always sounds like his word. Sometimes you'll hear somebody say, well, I think I just heard God tell me that I should leave my wife and marry this other lady. No, you didn't. God did not tell you that because that is contrary to his word. Are you hearing me tonight? It's contrary to his word. So when God speaks, he always sounds like his word. Listen now. And if we want to know what God looks like, we look to Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 14 and verse 9, Jesus answered, anyone that has seen me has seen the Father. Okay? Letter B. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now, in our physical world, my firstborn son is my son, Brian. He is the first of the three children that were born to me and Miss Bobby. And by the way, I'm recording this sermon tonight because by the time you hear this, I'm going to be in New Mexico visiting our sixth grandbaby, Abby Jo Hurst, the third daughter of Brian and Amber. Their firstborn was Lucy. But in context, in the biblical context and understanding of what this word means, it doesn't mean that Jesus was the firstborn in the series of creation. What it's speaking to is his rank and his position over all creation. In other words, he is the chief over all things. Letter C, write this down. He is the creator of all things. Now, before we move on from this subject, I would like to kind of take a little bit of a sidebar to help you get your mind wrapped around this. Did you know that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second? You heard me right, 186,000 miles per second. It's like, remember the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars? And uh, what was Harrison Ford's name in that? Han Solo. Han Solo, that's right. And he had Chewbacca. And uh, they would get in it, right? And he would say, uh, light speed. So if that were possible for a spaceship to go light speed, it would go 186,000 miles per second. So it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to travel the 93 million miles to Earth as we revolve around it in our solar system. Now, what is our solar system? It is the um, galaxy, or it it is in a galaxy. I'm sorry, our solar system is in a galaxy known as the what? Anybody know? Also known as the, a candy bar, right? The Milky Way, that's right. And watch this now, watch this. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years in diameter. And this is kind of hard. So if you were to go the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and you were to travel in the Millennium Falcon with Han Solo and Chewbacca, and you were to start from one end of the Milky Way and travel to the other, this is just incredible to think about, it would take you 100,000 years to travel the span of the Milky Way. And watch this. It is only one of billions of other galaxies in our observable universe. This is information that is hard to comprehend how big our universe is and how big creation is. And verse 16 says, for by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and indivisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him, and for him. That's who Jesus is. He's not just an icon. He's not just a figure on a necklace. He's not just a a character, a historical figure 
but he is the visible image of the invisible God. And then letter D says, in him all things hold together, that he's the glue holding the universe together. And when it feels like that the world is breaking apart and things are splitting at the seams, we can trust God's word in that Jesus is before all things and in him all things hold together. Come on, family, give me a good amen out there. All right, so he is Lord over creation, and then number two, he is Lord over the new creation. He's the Lord over the new creation, and we find this in verses 18 through 22. And listen, as awesome as creation is, and it is truly awesome. Someday I'll, I'll preach a sermon series on some of this stuff called Indescribable. It talks about how awesome God is and how great God is. And it's displayed through his creation as the scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And then Romans 1 says that the glory of God is revealed in his creation. And men don't have an excuse. We can see that there's a God but we, because we can see his creation. And as awesome as creation is, what is even more awesome is what God has done in saving us. You see, the Bible teaches in our text tonight that Jesus, first of all, write this down, it's in your notes, letter A, he is the head of the church. Now remember what the Greek word for church is? Come on, say it, Miss Helen. Ekklesia, man. Ekklesia. And that word means a calling out, an assembly, or a gathering, right? And that's where we get the name for our fellowship here, the worship gathering. We are a church. And churches sometimes get themselves in trouble. Listen, when something or someone other than Jesus is the Lord in the church, sometimes agendas get in the way. Sometimes personalities get in the way. Sometimes sin gets in the way. And any time something in the church is more important than Jesus, you have a church that's not on mission anymore. You have a church that's in trouble. Sometimes it's a celebrity minister, right? It's a doctrinal distinctive. Sometimes it's a particular uh, ministry that the church specializes in. But when the church becomes more about these things than Jesus, we get off base. Secondly, letter B, he is the firstborn. There's that word again, only this time it's from among the dead. Now, what are we talking about here? Well, this is speaking to the importance, the preeminence, the supremacy of the resurrection. Again, if you know my story, there was a time when my faith was challenged by a skeptic. And I wasn't sure how to answer them. And I had to go do digging. I had to do some research. I had to study. And it was upon studying the resurrection of Jesus, I became convinced that the resurrection is a historical fact in history. It's the only way to explain things like the empty tomb. It's the only way to explain the birth of the church upon which the leaders built it, insisting and preaching the resurrection of Jesus until their death. It's the only way to explain time being split in two. And so uh, the importance and the preeminence of Christ's resurrection is what we're talking about here. And the truth is that the cross of Jesus Christ, which is so very important, right? He says he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us in to the kingdom of the Son we love, in whom we have what? Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Or like we um, memorized in our Mark series, Mark 10 and verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? Ransom for many. There's that word, right? Ransom in verse 13 and 14, we have a redemption, So Christ's atoning sacrifice, dying on the cross in our place for our sins, being the propitiation for our sin, being the one, the the, the substitutionary atonement. He died, he took our sin on him. He shed his blood in our place. That should have been us. That's what we deserved. He didn't deserve any of it. We deserved all of it. And he took all of the punishment that we deserved and instead gave us all the mercy we didn't deserve. It's amazing. Am I right or am I right? But the truth is, is that the cross would mean nothing, family. The sacrifice on the cross would mean nothing without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And then letter C, write this down, it's in your notes, our reconciler, our reconciler. Our sin family created a massive gap between us and God. The text tells us that we were alienated. Isn't that what it said? We were alienated. We were far away from God. Isaiah 59 verse two says, your sins have separated you from your God. There's a gulf between us and God created by our sin and our sin nature. And we have no hope. It's a helpless place of a future that is a Christless eternity and a place created for the devil and and his angels called hell that God never intended for people to go to. But that's our future. It's what we deserve. The wages of sin is what? Death. It's what we deserve. And the ultimate death is this separation from God, and that's what sin does. And that's where we were. We were alienated from God. We were ostracized from God until God sent his son, Jesus, hallelujah, to die for us, to be the atoning sacrifice, and to three days later rise from the dead so that we could be brought near to him. He bridged that divide with the cross so that we could cross over to the other side and be reconciled to the Father. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And the truth is, he has a good case. Like if we were in the courtroom of heaven and the devil who is the accuser The prosecuting attorney is building his case. I don't know about you, but if the books were ever to be opened and every thought, every word, every deed, every time I told a lie, every time I had a lustful thought, every time I used God's name in vain, every time I dishonored my father and mother, every time I stole something that regardless of its value, every time I had anger in my heart and hatred for somebody and the books were open and and the record of wrong would be revealed, it would be surely evidence to convict me beyond any reasonable doubt. The case could be easily built and I would surely be headed toward a guilty verdict and to be eternally punished. But I'm so grateful that the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting attorney, doesn't have the last word, that we have a defense attorney, amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. And just about the time that you feel like the gavel's gonna fall, Jesus, our defender, our intercessor, our go-between, stands up and say, I have an objection And though it's true that the record of wrong is great, um, I've paid the price for Brian's sin. And now that record of wrong has been nailed to the cross. And when Jesus sees me, he doesn't see my record of wrong. He only sees the blood of Jesus that makes us white as snow. Come on, somebody, give God praise in the house of God tonight. Would have thought, family that in Christ we are holy in God's sight without blemish and free from accusation. And if you can help us back there, begin to bring the service for a close. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And it simply says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has gone, the new has come. And so my question for all of you tonight is, we should just examine ourselves to make sure we are in Christ. And how is it that we become in Christ? Well, the easiest way for me to remember it is ABC, ABC, 
Easy as one, two, three, A, B, C. It starts with A, we admit that we've sinned before God. We say, God, I, I've sinned against you. I admit it, I'm not gonna try to hide it. I have no excuses. And for that, I'm sorry. I have remorse and, and there's repentance in my heart. I admit it, I, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of forgiveness. And then the B is to believe that God sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place for our sins and that he rose again on the third day. It's just like Romans 10, 9 says that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And then the letter C is confess. You just bring that confession that Jesus Christ is now both the forgiver of my sin and the Lord of my life, that I'm not going to stop at only making him my savior. I'm also going to make him in my life preeminent. I'm gonna make him in my life kuros. I'm gonna make him in my life supreme in authority. The word of God presents Jesus so much more than just a religious figure. He is more than just a picture or a crucifix on a wall and we have to resist we have to resist the world and the culture and the spirit that's in in our world today that seeks to diminish who Jesus is and so I'm calling you family tonight to make a commitment or a recommitment both as individuals and as an assembly of believers tonight that we are going to exalt we're going to magnify Jesus to his rightful place in glory as Lord of over all creation and as our Savior King. Will you stand your feet all over the room tonight and let's pray. Would you pray this prayer with me? Just say, Dear God, I know I've sinned against you. For that I'm sorry and I'm humbly asking that you will forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and that he rose from the grave on the third day. And it is my confession that you, Jesus, are the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I'm gonna walk with you, I'm gonna serve you, I'm gonna do the best I can every day. I love you because you first loved me. I love you, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Would you lift your hands and let me pray the blessing over you tonight. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. And we put the name of Jesus all over you and declare that you are blessed to be a blessing. Come on, family, say it with me. And now we leave, not from the church, but as the church, dressed in the full armor of God, we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes that are fitted for the readiness of the gospel of peace. We take up the shield of faith, knowing it quenches every fiery dart of the enemy and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And we declare that every piece of ground that our feet walk on is ours to take. And we pray that as we leave this place, and we go into the marketplace, may the kingdom of Satan be pushed back and the kingdom of Jesus advanced. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, the strong son of God, and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. I love you, family. Have an awesome week. I will see you next Sunday night. Have a great night.